It's the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. We look at our first major conversation and the focus this morning is the inability of Nigeria to meet her quota that's been put out by the OPEC. Nigeria missed out its crude oil output target for January 2022, pumping 1.46 million barrels per day against a target of 1.683 million barrels per day as approved by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC. The inability of Nigeria to meet her target is as a result of pipeline vandalism, delay in full implementation of the Petroleum Industry Act, among others. Other countries in this category include Angola, Congo, Equatorial Guinea. We will be looking at the economic implication of the shortcoming as we have an analyst join the conversation. Muktak Mohammed is an economist. Uh, it's good to have you join us uh, this morning on the show. Good morning, Muktak Mohammed. Thank you. My pleasure. Good morning. All right. Uh, Muktak Mohammed is an economist. He's also a financial advisor and an investment banker. Uh, let, let's quickly start off on this note. What do you make of the fact that Nigeria again has been unable to meet her target in terms of production as been stipulated by OPEC? Well, it's not good news for us as a country and it, because it took it down to being oil, our only major source of um, external revenue at the moment. And so um, that is not good news for us. And um, that means that we are actually losing a lot and that is already affecting our federation account in terms of our, our allocation. And unfortunately, again, it's during the time that oil, oil prices peak seven years high that we are experiencing this. Uh, for me, it's... Um, it's a challenge that the government has not been able to deal with, even previous governments, not just this government. I think uh, we need to do the right thing. And of course, both of those challenges are not rocket science. There are things that could be addressed with technology. There are things also that could be addressed in terms of being firm in decision making, especially when you come up with a, with, 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 with a template or a document that you think you should, you should uh, use to grow a, a particular sector. So what we're saying is that we had a document, we have everything that we thought was working for us. All of a sudden, the government put a break on it. So it's policy some sort also is a part of the problem that we have in terms of meeting some of these demands. Well, um, some of the excuses or the concerns that have been put out by the authorities is that, uh, first of all, the issue of us being unable to meet uh, the target is as a result of the uh, activities of um, vandals, so vandalism of uh, pipelines, all theft, amongst other issues. Do you, do you really agree with this? Because, I mean, these issues have always been with us in terms of, you know, production. Uh, I mean, meeting our target. As of 2016, yes. just to also, just to put it out, in 2016, uh, we, we had a capacity of producing about 2 million barrels per day. So, and this issue of oil theft and vandalism has always been with us, even as of 2016. So, what could really, really be the reason why uh, we are not meeting the target that's been put out by, the, um, by OPEC? Well, vandalism is part of it, definitely. Then, we're not talking about oil thief. Also, it's part so not is the PI, PI bill that uh, was not, has not seen the light of the day. And when you look at vandalism, you, you tie to the PI, personal industry bill, also PIB bill. Because if you remember, that bill was also meant to address vandalism. Because the oil community, you have the pipeline that passed through your area, then you'll be given a percentage if that pipeline is not vandalized. By you. And if that pipeline is vandalized, you are not entitled to that. So when that law is not passing into play, also it also has an implication that means the vendors can continue to do what they want to do. The oil thieves can continue to do what they want to do. Secondly, again, you must not um, look at uh, in terms of divestment because major uh, oil marketers are also selling some of their assets to Nigerians. And it will take time for this Nigerian company to begin to uh, enhance this asset and begin to make it productive. So those, for me, are the key indices that are causing what we are seeing. As in, even the vandalization, like I said, it's not rocket science. It's just that government has not had the political way or the technology to drive, to drive that. And that also has to come in. When you, when you have to do such things, you need to come up with a bill to address this. And that bill has come in place. But unfortunately, there's uncertainty in that bill as it stands. No, so um, Muktak Mohammed, my concern here is in 2016, if we look at the production capacity of the country, we were producing up to 2 million barrels per day. 
as it was. Uh, so, and the issue of vandalism at the time did not disappear. So you still have, uh, you know, vandalism or vandalization of the, the, the pipelines, oil pipelines, amongst other issues, the issue of theft. I mean, you also want to talk about uh, the, the, the issue of the uh, uh, militants in the region, even though at this point in time we're experiencing some relative peace. So why is it that at this point in time we're making excuse, we're making an excuse for vandalism, the issue of militancy, oil theft, as an excuse not to meet the quota that's been put out? For a country that is very dependent on oil production and looking at the current oil price right now, one should think that we should take advantage of this and push our production. Yes, I agree with you. In 2016, yeah, we had those challenges and we, we had oil production. Still at 2 million barrels. But not to forget that we have a pandemic also that also played a role in terms of production. And remember, this is not just relevant. This is not just Nigeria alone. Even Angola also has been affected by this. So it's more or less like supply chain destruction due to the pandemic also contribute to what we are seeing now. Even if you those other indices that you have placed about have, has always been there. But now I think added with the pandemic also must have increased that. Remember, and again, we are beginning to get a lot of data from Niger data that the, a lot of illegal refineries have increased over the over the years. Because in 2015, we may have some illegal refineries, but not compared to now. When you look, when you look at what the governor of River State is saying, that we some weeks some few weeks ago, so it's all about security. Security must have improved in terms of um, uh, 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 relative peace in the Niger Delta. But those security may come at a cost because if it's security officials are not the one involved in, 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 in oil thief and oil pipeline. That means there's a lot of compromise. So that also could increase, could attribute to the, to, to the downturn that we are seeing in terms of production. But basically, I think one of the major causes of this destruction we must not let the, take it away that the pandemic also has played a very huge role in that. And the fact that it's not only Nigeria that is affected, also Angola and some other uh, OPEC producing nations. Okay, um, well, th that sounds, uh, you know, somehow, uh, maybe, you know, to some extent, okay, you, you probably might just make an excuse for COVID among other issues. But uh, it's really quite worrisome because if you look at our production capacity and, you know, the quota that's been pushed out, we haven't really been meeting it, you know, for a very long time. But let's also look at some concerns that some experts have raised. That they're talking about the, P, uh, the PIA, and the fact that that has also contributed. I'd like you to take us through how that has affected, you know, our, uh, you know, meeting of the target for oil production. Yes, that has affected strongly because um, before now, most of the major oil marketers and most of those that want to come to Nigeria were looking at the PIA bill to determine where, when, when they want to come into the country. Would, there, would that bill be passed into law? Will it make it a level playing ground? Will we still have subsidy? Or, or, or what, what is the, in terms of relationship with the, commit, the community that will be producing from? And that bill came into law, and most of them were, um, I mean, getting ready to begin to say, look, we want to invest in this country at the, at, at, as it stands because the bill had been passed into law. Some of them were going through the bill. All of a sudden, within, within uh, uh, months, the full implementation of that bill, the government is saying now that we don't think that bill could see the light of the day because, uh, but it's not the totality of that bill, but the main bone of contention of that bill has always been the oil subsidy. And that is what the major marketers and other people that want to come and invest in Nigeria, other companies that want to come invest in Nigeria are looking at because I cannot come to invest in, a, in an environment that is full with uncertainty. If I invest here, if I'm producing petroleum product, will I be also be paid uh, uh, subsidy? In the terms of nature, in terms of my own production, also that is a major challenge they were also looking at. And unfortunately, like I said, um, government have turned back on that decision, and so it's a very huge um, um, setback to the oil industry. Very, very huge setback to the oil industry. So, but with the fact that we're not being able to meet the 1.68 million naira barrels per day that's been put out uh, by the uh, by OPEC. How do we then now, you know, the issue of the 2022 budget, how do we not fund the budget? Funding the budget has been a challenge and it will continue to be a challenge because, again, the government does not have the political will to fund uh, to go about the budget. We look for easy way out of every situation that we find ourselves. And now the easy way out for the government is to keep borrowing to address those issues. So the government will continue doing that because that's the easy way out. 
The other way out, which is not easy, but we, we need a lot of work, is for government to begin to look at some of our key projects as a means of security to begin to secure, maybe what we call the PPP, the Public-Private Partnership. That will also help in terms of funding of the budget. Because when you look at the budget deficits, you look at deficits this time not so much in the recurrent expenditure. But most of those deficits that most of the borrowing are in terms of capital expenditure, in terms of projects. So can those projects become like a, like a PPP, PPP, whereby we can use those projects as a means of collateral and tell you and operate for the next 25 years and two day there, then you will have to pay uh, some of this debt. And the beauty about it is that you will have a snowball effect because it does not stop them from paying tax and those that were employed by those who pay tax. So government will gain gain. In the short term, they will still gain. In the long run, they will maintain high gains. So the other, the, the, the key way is to look inwardly and begin to drive our economy. And the other ways again is to use tax also. But in terms of this government, we see tax as a means of revenue. Government does not look at tax as a means to grow the economy. So definitely, there is a challenge, and there will continue to be a challenge. The problem in Nigerian budget will always be revenue because government have not come up with key strategy in terms of building revenue from up. I mean, from down to up. So, but let's also look at the general implication of all of this on our economy. Uh, what, is, what does this mean for the Nigerian economy at this time? And uh, in terms of monetary value, how much are we losing? In terms of monetary value, we are losing millions of dollars, uh, especially. I, I can't really quantify the amount now, but when you look at the two, bit, two million barrel, I mean, I mean, that you said in 2016, and compared to 1.64 million, so we're already losing our almost 300 million barrel. So that is huge and for, for in monitoring, monitoring term. But again, we have to look at the economic term. Again, that also means it's going to affect a lot of projects, like you pointed out in the budget deficit. And that also means that it's going not going to affect only federal government, it's going to affect all the states. Because even with the rising price in crude oil, which is supposed to bring more money to the local government, to the state government, and to the federal government, we've seen that the latest support Nigerian Bureau of Statistics or for the from from the from the revenue sharing um, formula says that this these states are not getting that because of this shortfall. So it's a very huge one and it's going to affect us economically very, very, very well, especially in the area of meeting some of our key capital expenditure projects. So apart from the key capital expenditure project, how how does all how will it also affect you know Nigerians, the common man, as we like to always put it on the streets? Why you are the common man is simple. We will not earn more dollars, and most of the things that we 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 we, we bring we, we we consume in these countries is imported from outside the shore of the country. So the rate the exchange rate volatility will continue to see it because we are not earning more dollar to begin to trade the the, the 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 demand and supply angle because all what you are seeing in the volatility has to do with demand and supply. So once we are not telling that, then the cost of goods and services will go up, and that is what really affects the common man. So let's also share your thought. Uh, some economists have also uh, posited that uh, the morale of the upstream sector is very low. And as a result, you also have the IOCs moving away from the use of fossil fuel and tilting towards the global energy. Uh, at this point in time, we are still grappling with you know, uh, fossil fuel and its use and the fact that we're very dependent, our economy is dependent you know, on oil for her revenue. Uh, how would Nigeria, you know, survive in the midst of all of this? Is there anything that can be done? Definitely a lot have been done. I mean, it is a service sector that grew any economy all over the world. If you look at the, the multi-trillion companies all over the world, they're all in the service sector. And service sector is driven by technology. And Nigeria is not yet ready. Even if you look at the PI, that PAI, PIA bill, you see that we are still making a provision from the NMPC revenue for the discovery of more wells. We are not looking at other ways of new renewable energy because, like I said, we always look for the easy way out. And we've forgotten that by 2030, most of those com uh, countries that are meant by our crude oil uh, will be we, will be new from there. They will be using fossil fuel. They'll be going more for green. We are not looking at the future like we've always done as a country because we are still uh, in the fear of our raw material. Meanwhile, the, the world has gone beyond the raw material. They are beginning to look at value-added services via the raw material and drive these value-added services that technology. I don't think we have that. And also, that is challenging because you cannot drive technology without power. 
So we must address all key infrastructural challenges. So as it stands now, it's very going to be a huculous tax, whether for this present administration or for the incoming administration. And it's not going to be a one-off thing. It's going to take years. So we need to start doing the right thing at the right time. And the first one we need to do, we need to begin to look at power. We need to begin to look, bring your bills that we encourage, especially the enterprising Nigerian youth to begin to set up a technological driven company to begin to enhance some of this product and add value to it. And that will be the key driver of our economy going forward. Okay, so uh, as we begin to close the conversation down right now, uh, Brent, uh, which uh, is actually used to price the oil market for Nigeria, report says that we're looking at uh, $80 or $88 per, I mean, per barrel in terms of sales right now. Is there anything that we can actually do you know, to up our production? Is there any way out of this so we can make money? Uh, because at the end of the day, that would be it. Now that we're having the prices uh, globally, we're looking at $90 per barrel. And of course, uh, the, um, the price bench for us right now, the, cr the crude against Nigeria, uh, which she is being judged or practiced by, has dropped by that margin of 0.78%. And so it leaves us at $88 uh, dollar per barrel. Is there anything that we can do to push production up? Because I think that this price is fair. Generally, it's fair when you look at our benchmark um, with the current budget at um, $60 per barrel. So we are already having an excess to put into our excess crude account of about $28. Uh, so that is good for us. But how? what do we do to push up to make sure we meet up with some of these uh, demands is a major challenge. And I think the first thing we need to look at now is begin to beef up security in those areas. We need to beef up security. We need to go to those communities that are the vendors are because these vendors are not spirit. They are people that are living with the community, and some of them are doing this because of their 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 grief. I once one um, decision or the order from the OEM companies that are located in their in their area. So we begin to need to look to see how we can address this situation because remember that uh, some years ago during the administration we came up with the amnesty program. That's when we had the highest. In terms, of, in terms of production, because we made the locals to begin to guide that. And that is why the PAIA bill would have been one of those um, game changers, because now every community wants to protect pipeline that pass through their area to, for them to gain 5% of that. So we need to go back to make the, uh, the community realize the gain that they have to make, let them know that the PAI bill has not been thrown out completely. It's just that we have challenge in terms of the subsidies. So once this pipeline pass through here, you still have that 5% in terms of income from it. So I think if we do that, we need to engage them because definitely when you talk of OFT, then the securities will need to do more on that because, I mean, it's not rocket science. These are uh, high, high refinery. Why does it take this, the, the governor of a state to begin to discover illegal refineries that have been operating for a long time? So the security apparatus need to up their game too and make sure they address these challenges. But I think majorly we need to engage the communities in terms of making them know that our part ownership of every pipeline that passed through their community. But we, we have also seen the River State Governor, yes, some week, being very vocal in terms of, um, I mean, of recent times, in terms of the activities of illegal refineries. And you also want to agree with me that the government has promised that the Port Harcourt refinery, you know, in 2022 will be open uh, functional, uh, you know, functioning up to its minimal capacity, and that therefore should mean some good news. Do you see that also helping us in terms of pushing up our uh, production output or our target, as it were, has been put out by the uh, relevant authority. When we look at um, when we when we look at um, what the NMPC is saying about um, the uh, potato refinery come in soon, and when we look at the money that have been put in there in terms of last year, about the hundred billion was paid as salary, and yet there was not a single production. It does not come for good news. You 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 shouldn't be excited about that, and then we should know that. In terms of uh, when we have our local refinery, we are looking more or less on in terms of um, 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 crude, um, um, I mean, indigenous uh, uh, um, production to up our indigenous so that we will not import more of those uh, refined petroleum products. So when we talk about refinery, we are talking about refined petroleum product. That is good news to meet up only our local demand. But saying meeting up the international demand in terms of um, oil price, there's still a lot to be done on that. And like I said, that has to do with a lot of security. Improving the refinery is all about meeting our local demand. But in terms of improving the security for the exportation of crude oil, that is meeting up international demands and also be able to begin to make uh, add up money to, the, to, to, our, to our federation account. So there are two different things. 
One is for the local, but in terms of address that one that will bring income to Nigeria, which has to do with crude oil production, we need to do more in the area of security and engaging the communities. So I, I seem to be lost somewhere, and I, I don't mind a clarity on the issue, because the argument over time by uh, specialists or professionals in this particular segment who say that the reason why we are constantly the way we are is because we have to export our products and then import it back, the refined product. And so the argument over time has been that let's get the refineries functional. And so if the government is saying that in 2022 we're going to have the Potakot refinery being, ref uh, I mean, rehabilitated and functioning at its capacity and producing at the capacity that it has been, uh, you know, created to produce, then it should also contribute. So I I'd like to get some clarity there, please. Yeah, the clarity I'm telling you that even if it's produced, it's producing for locals. I mean, we're going to be thinking of local demands. The refinery, all about, we talk about the refineries in, in, in the area of meeting up our local demands, not me, because we don't, ref we don't export refineries. And what we ref what we export is crude, the, the, the raw material, the crude petroleum product. So what I mean is that if that refinery comes to play like they are promising, then it will be able to meet up local demand. And so what we are looking at meeting up local demand, that means it will draw that in terms of subsidy payments that government normally paid in terms of importing of this uh, refined product from outside the shore of this station. That's, that's basically what I'm trying to talk about. Not really that meeting up with international demand. Any for the refinery that we are looking towards working we want to reduce the importation of this food uh, product from Nigeria, and the way that uh, the other way that you could agree with you that it could help us is in terms of our revenue because that means that we will not be spending so much in importing refined petroleum products so that could have a bottom line in terms of the sharing to the three um, 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 tier of government that is what uh, that's the that's where it will come so the refinery itself we boost our revenue internally, especially because that will reduce our dependence on imported refined petroleum products. Okay, so um, um, this also is also another concern that's been put out there, the issue of the joint venture and the fact that the government is participating. That's affecting and making it so impossible for oil companies uh, you know, to have its way. Would you mind to share your thoughts on the issue of joint venture in terms of you know, the oil sector and how it affects our output as a country in terms of meeting the target? That is where that is why the PAIB was to, uh, to was to address in terms of joint venture because government was looking at uh, making their, this uh, its own part of the sh um, shares to begin to go to Nigeria and generally at the long run going to make like NMPC also begin to be a part owner the Ministry of Petroleum Resources have a particular number of shares from this joint venture so they wanted to look at it and in the long run this this will be sold out to Nigerian public and it become a a, a private driven economy that will only just the profit then will go to government. Government will not be putting so much in there. But unfortunately, like I said, the, the bill has not seen the light of the day. That is the only way because it's not in the business of government to be in business. We keep saying if government is supposed to be a regulator, create the enabling environment whereby businesses can strive. So when government goes into business, it gives room for a lot of corruption because in terms of auditing of this account, you, you just look back to the uh, NMPC telling us that uh, it's possible they have needed about three trillion in terms uh, to deal with uh, subsidy. And they are not giving any data to tell us these are daily consumption, these are monthly consumption. What is responsible for this increase in quarter? All right. Uh, so it's not business of government to be in business. Well, I, I wish we had more time uh, to continue with the conversation, but I uh, would like to let you go at this point in time. Thank you so much, Muktak Mohammed, for being part of the conversation. We appreciate your time right here. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, Muktak Mohammed is an economist, is also uh, a financial investor, as an investment banker, by the way, and also an, a financial analyst. Uh, thank you so much for being part of the conversation. We do appreciate. We will have to take a break right now. When we return, a second conversation, we look at the Senate confirming seven nominees as INEC commissioners. And uh, we would also look at what that means for us looking at the 2023 elections. Stick around, we'll be right back.